so good to see this room beginning to fill up again. So one day this past summer, I was walking my dog. Some of you might have heard about my dog because I talk about her a lot. Her name is Nancy. She's this like feral white mutt that we adopted in the fall of 2017. And I ran into another dog walker. Her name is Tracy, someone I really like to talk to. I've met all kinds of great people since we adopted a, a dog. And I noticed this really interesting tattoo on her arm. And I asked her about it, and she told me that the tattoo was of a Yorba queen. Never heard of a Yorba queen before, or a Yorba kingdom or queendom. And I asked her why that image was tattooed on her arm. And it turned out that some years ago, I don't know if any of you heard of this, uh, Google had this thing where you submit your selfie and they give you back some image from a major museum around the world. So what she got back was this Yorba Queen. Not a specific Yorba Queen, but a Yorba Queen. And the reason she tattooed it on her arm, she told me, is to remember her own sense of worth, no matter what the world was projecting back at her. So I said, yeah, it sounds like to remind you of your dignity and divinity. And she said, yeah. And from that day on, she called the tattoo lady, the queen, Didi, the dignity and the divinity. So we have in our tradition, as many of you know, a profound and powerful concept to remind us of our inherent worth it's called Selimo Elohim, having been created in the image of God. Our very bodies and souls, one might say, are walking mirrors for the divine on this earth. But we forget, don't we? We forget about our own dignity and divinity. We undervalue ourselves, our bodies, our minds, our souls. We undervalue one another. Recently, I've been listening to um, parts of this book called The Undervalued Self by Elaine Aaron. She also wrote Highly Sensitive People, for any of you who might have read that. Um, and she, she names two basic approaches um, that we take to one another and our own self. One is ranking and the other is linking. So in ranking, we often, let's say, compare ourselves to other people. Like to take a wild example, I might, you know, meet another rabbi and say, um, wow, they know a lot more Talmud than I do. Or, you know, you meet someone else and like, oh, they know so much more about current events. I really, I really don't understand anything about the world. Or that person has a better voice than I do. Like my friend over there. <laughs> or that person is prettier in better shape or has a nicer home or a better life. Or you look on Facebook and it's like, compare, despair, compare, despair. I imagine like none of you have ever done this. Um, the list is endless, right? I mean, as many people are, as are in this room, I imagine each of you could give me like a dozen ways that you compare yourself to one another. It also can go in the opposite direction. I'm really more articulate than my colleague over there, or I'm a better athlete or lawyer or rabbi or doctor or, or writer or artist than that person, or, or here's one that's really ironic. I'm really more spiritual than that person. <laughs> or I'm a better meditator, whatever that means. <laughs> um, we could really rank one another about anything. It reminds me of a story, again, about my dog. You think I'm a little obsessed about my dog, and, and I am. Um, so uh, we got her in 2017. I think she was about a year, a year and a half old. She came from Texas. And, after, and she was like the most playful dog in the world. She played with every single dog we saw. And I'd sit in the, the dog run, and I was so proud of my Nancy playing, wag, <laughs> tail wagging. And after about a year, instead of playing with all the other dogs, she sat by my side and she wouldn't move. And I was like, come on, Nancy, play with the other dogs. And she wouldn't do it. And um, I started to think, oh my God, I've ruined my dog. Like, what did I do? And I thought the other dogs are better. The other dog owners were better than me. And, um, and I found out from my trainer 
that as dogs get older, they get more selective about who they play with. It's almost like a, a human being, right? You don't just play with anybody, you know, when you're an adult. Um, and they become more task focused, like, you know, focus on balls and frisbees and sticks, exactly what happened to Nancy. But until I found that out, I was all about ranking myself and comparing myself to others. So what's the alternative to ranking? Elaine Aaron explains, linking is the alternative to ranking, meaning you can actively connect to one another instead of constantly sizing yourself up in relationship to others. You can connect to someone's joy about their accomplishment instead of feeling inferior. Or if they are feeling undervalued, undervalued, link to how they're feeling and try and raise them up to their rightful dignity and divinity. Or when someone pulls rank on you, so to speak, you can recognize that they're a little insecure and have compassion, but don't belittle yourself. Keep affirming yourself in the face of their belittlement, even if you do it out loud, not in a way that sets you above or for that matter below the other person, just in a way that sets you with the other person as, as having equal value. You can keep your eye, your focus on connecting with people with linking instead of your relative status. It's sort of revolutionary if you think about it. Instead of having to constantly prove your worth because you feel insecure, you can do the opposite. Or I'm sorry, or, or maybe sometimes what we do is downplay our worth because people around us are insecure, right? So not doing that and not doing that. Um, and even in competitive areas, Aaron says, we can enjoy healthy competition and remember the humanity of the other, maybe with a handshake before a game or a handshake after the game. And as it turns out, ranking and linking and the undervalued self is exactly what's at play in this, this week's Parsha. Actually, there's a lot of ranking and unfortunately not much linking. It's a little sad. I imagine most of you are familiar with the story of Joseph, either through reading the Torah or maybe seeing the technical, the technicolor dream code. The story begins with Joseph as a 17 year old shepherd assistant to his brothers, specifically the brothers born of the maidservants Bilha and Zilpa. Um, and what does Joseph do as he assists these, you know, these brothers, these shepherds? He tattles on his brother. To, on his brothers to his father. Yosef adibatam ra'a el, avi, el avihem. Joseph is a teenage tattler. Nothing more annoying than that. He is pulling rank over his brothers, increasing his status by demeaning them. And Jacob makes things much worse by explicitly favoring Joseph and giving him a coat of many colors. Yisrael ahevet Yosef mikol banav ki ven zikunim hu hulo ba'asel lo ketonet pasim. Israel loved Joseph best of all his sons, for he was a child of his old age, and he made for him a coat of many colors. Horror of horrors. Talk about family dynamics. Jacob throws the equivalent of a lighted match on a gasoline-soaked rag. And what do, what do Joseph's brothers do? They hate him. They hate him every, even more. It says, They hated him, and they could not speak peaceably with him. And to make matters even worse, Joseph shares these dreams he has, which sets him at the center of the world, dreams in which his sheaf of wheat bow low, I'm sorry, his brother's sheaves of wheat bow low to his sheep of wheat, or dreams in which the sun and the moon and the stars bow down to him. He's clearly, at least in his mind, the center of the universe. No one is worth as much as Joseph. And you all know what happens. One day when he goes out to see his brothers, actually his father sends him to see his brothers um, shepherding in Shrem, that terrible place where his sister was raped and there was a mass massacre um, of all the Shechemites by the brothers. 
Joseph goes and they grab him and rip off, strip off his coat of many colors and throw him into a pit, right? The ultimate devaluing of Joseph. You know, the ultimate trying to um, feel better about themselves in the, in, the, in, the, in the face of their own sense of worthlessness. What a depressing story. I mean, where's, I mean, this is our Torah, this is our Parsha. Where's the redemption in all this? What is this about? It's like, you know, brother destroy brother and break the heart of their father and lie and cheat and deceive. What, like, why are we reading this story? I think there's an explanation, or at least I'm going to try an interpretation on, on you. If we take a few steps back, a few generations back to Abraham, if you remember, Abraham had a vision in which God told him that his descendants would be enslaved. How did God know? This was the plan. This was the destiny from the very beginning. Maybe God understood that this family, or just living in a family, was not enough to figure out ethical behavior. Maybe the way the brothers undervalued and ranked each other and, and sort of played master and slave with one another, and in fact sold their brother into slavery, was a kind of spiritual and emotional slavery that was made manifest in their descendants in the book of Exodus. And maybe they needed, these slaves needed to be liberated in order to understand their own self-worth. If you think about all the generations, Yitzchak and Yishmael, Jacob and Esau, Joseph, Jacob, Joseph and his brothers, they compete, they lie, they cheat, they deceive, they break their father's hearts, each one has an overvalued or undervalued self. There's no reprieve. One could say there were spiritual and emotional slaves before they were actual slaves. I just want to take a step back and say, no way do I think that this is true outside of literature. Like in our sacred literature, this sort of karmic reality is, is manifested in physical slavery or a story of physical labor, slavery. But no way do I think that anyone enslaved in the world is um, sort of you know, an expression of um, their own lack of valuing themselves or each other, right? That's a lack of value by their enslavers. But this is a story in which internal, emotional and spiritual reality becomes ultimately manifest in the institution of slavery for their descendants. They remain slaves until God redeems them, sufficiently esteems them, and from liberation brings them to revelation for connection with God at Sinai, when they stand as divine reflection. Freed by God's mighty lo loving hand, they stand in the sands of Sinai, finally becoming in their own eyes and the eyes of one another, God's image, a smidge of the divine sublime. Finally, instead of being ranked as worthless by Egyptian masters, God hears their cry and links to them, each one of them, by freeing them and speaking to them at Sinai. And of course, this issue, the issue of undervaluing each other is so very live in our world, so very dangerous and electric. Consider what happened this week in Brunswick, Georgia. There was an extraordinary victory for the side of valuing the self, valuing a grossly undervalued, undervalued human being. Three white men were held accountable for killing a black man while jogging. Asserting rank, they assert rank and dominance through violence. But the jury recognized the dignity of Amud Arbery. It gives me just a little bit of hope that our world is changing, maybe. Changing to a world where the dignity and divinity of people whose society undervalues, whether because of gender or skin color or different ability or age or class or simply, well, just simply because will be valued rather than ranked. 
After all, when we desecrate the dignity of another human being, we are desecrating the image of God here on this earth. Human beings rank each other constantly. We do it to each other, we do it to ourselves, but God, dare I suggest, is the one who links to every one of us, no matter how we are valued or undervalued in the eyes of society. Theologically, one could say that God is the one who looks at every human being and sees a mirror of divinity again and again and again. So think about it. Whether you're standing in the mirror saying, I'm not the right size, remember you're a prize. If you're pulling rank on yourself, remember you're a mighty tank. Give no truck to anyone who says you stank. With luck, you'll get out of the muck and give thanks for who you are without rank. And if you think the other is full of shame and you move into blame, remember you're the same. Love your neighbor as yourself, say the holy rabbis, because the other is yourself. You are me and I am you. The other reflects God as much as you were a holy stew of humanity. For this is reality, authenticity, human capacity. It's not audacity. For this, on this night, I stand here full of grace in your sight, full of thanksgiving, not ranksgiving. And please don't rank this sermon. Instead, move into thanks, because I worked hard to give you this gift for Hanukkah. Did not intend to create a rift between me and you, so don't give it short shrift. <laughs> she rhymes better than I do. <laughs> because me and you were holy on this holy night, seen more deeply because of this coming holiday of lights. Our rights are clear, so don't stand weakly or discreetly. Stand up uniquely, create it in the image, because each person in your sight, in my sight, in your sight is full of divine might that holy, brilliant, divine, sublime mirror, not refined, not perfect, simply human, the human capacity to reflect the source of all life, no strife, a refraction, no distraction, no subtraction or retraction, a divine conception, no exception. So whenever you feel demeaned, undervalued, ranked as worthless, remember Didi, the dignity and the divinity. Shabbat Shalom.